the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Mother and our Queen. I would say that this, of all the proclaimed dogmas of the Catholic Church, this one is the most misunderstood and the most confused by both Catholics and Protestants and Eastern Orthodox. Everyone seems to be a little bit off on the Immaculate Conception. So today we're going to do briefly and quickly, we're going to do five things. First, I'm going to read to you the definition of Pius IX. Maybe you've never heard it before. The definition of Pius IX regarding what the Immaculate Conception is. The Immaculate Conception is the idea that the Blessed Virgin Mary, her two parents, we know them as St. Anne and St. Joachim, when the sperm of St. Joachim and the ovum of St. Anne met, a new person was created, body and soul. And in that very first instance of personal existence of the Virgin Mary, in that moment, God saved her and preserved her from original sin, and from that moment moving forward, preserved her from all sin, actual sin, mortal and venial sin, so that her entire life she was sinless. The word immaculate means without stain. Immaculate means lacking a macula. In Latin, macula is a stain. So Our Lady is preserved from all stain. And then I'm going to give you four arguments three from the Bible, one from common sense, on why it is the case that Our Lady was preserved from original sin and actual sin. won't take long at all. We're going to use the Bible, and you can use these with your family and with your friends. First, educate yourself, then you can educate other people. And to begin, we are going to pray, and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer in Latin. Oremos. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniant regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panam nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos a malo. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Our Lady Immaculate Conception, pray for us. Okay, well, you know, one of the um, the tricky things about the Immaculate, Immaculate Conception is the belief from the very beginning that the mother of the Messiah, the mother of God, would be preserved from sin. It's in many, many church fathers. I'm not going to go through church fathers today. That would take a lot of time. I've done that in other videos. But also, Mary herself, in the Gospel of St. Luke, Mary herself, chapter 1, verse 40, where is it here? 47. Verse 47. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She says, Mary says, God is her Savior. So there needs to be a way in which Mary is saved by God through the merits of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet she's preserved from personal guilt and personal sin and original sin. How is that possible? Well, in the definition given by Pope Pius IX in 1854, we read this. The most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. So it's a singular grace. No one has ever received this. No one will ever receive it. It is by grace and it is a privilege by Almighty God. And the Pope says, it is by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race. 
So we can say Mary was saved. The analogy is, let's say you have a big pool uh, full of mud. And every single one of us, when we're conceived in our mother's womb, we conceived and we fall into this mud, the original sin. And we're stained. We need baptism. right? Through the merits of Jesus Christ, we're brought into newness of life. This is St. Paul. Well, in the case, the singular, singular privilege of Our Lady, it's as if she was falling in and before, and it can't even really say before because it was in the very instant of her conception, she was saved. So she was saved in the most perfect way. And you can say to Protestants, you can say, is it not the case that one of the Ten Commandments is honor thy father and mother? We call that the fourth commandment in the Catholic Church. Honor thy father and mother. There's hand signs to all that. I've done a video on it. But the fourth commandment is, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Honor thy father and mother. Fourth commandment. And you say to your Protestant friend, is, did Jesus perfectly honor God the Father? And they will say, of course. He honored him even unto death. And then you say, well, did Christ also in a supernatural and super abundant way honor his mother? And they'll say, I never thought of that. I guess he did. Yeah, Christ would have honored his mother perfectly and super abundantly. And so the next question is, well, what is the most perfect and powerful way to save a person? How would you honor them with the most perfect package of salvation? If you were God with all of your wisdom and all of your power, what would be the perfect way to package salvation for the person, the human person that you must honor the most? Your mother. Jesus Christ, honor your father, honor your mother. How would he perfectly and super abundantly honor his mother? He would save her in the very first instant. She would be predestined to be saved in that very first instant. Her justification, her sanctification, her regeneration, everything complete in the beginning. That's what Catholics believe in the Immaculate Conception. Now let's look at the Bible. The classic place is Luke 1.28. Here, the angel came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. This is part of the Hail Mary, part of the Ave Maria. We Catholics pray it every single day. It's straight out of the Bible, Luke 1.28. Now, some Protestant translations will say, highly favored one, or um, I don't know what else. They, I think highly favored one is pretty common. But if we look at the Greek, it's actually a really long and complicated Greek term that St. Saint, Saint Luke uses in chapter 1, verse 28. The Greek word is kakeratomene, kakeratomene. And the root word there is kari, kari. That's where we get the word grace in Greek. So the root of the word that the angel is saying to Mary, the root word there is grace in Greek. But it's in a past perfect form in the Greek language. Now, what does that mean? So it's the word grace made into a verb. And it's commonly used in Greek. It's not like a special created word. But it's the, the word grace in its verbal form in a past perfect form. What it means in Greek is, is that something happened in the past perfectly and continues into the present. That's the meaning of a past perfect perfect form. So how do we translate this in English? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. What we would have to say is something like when he says, hail full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Hail she who was perfectly graced in the past and continues to be perfectly graced. That's a mouthful. We could translate it that way, but it's a, it's a mouthful. So what did St. Jerome, when he translated it, 
in Latin. What did he put? He put gratia plena, full of grace, full of grace. My computer's wanting to remind me to do something. No, thank you. But what do we see here? We see that the angel, now this is not just a fallible human. This is an angel sent from heaven who is inaugurating the new covenant in announcing the incarnation of the Son of God into the womb of a virgin named Mary who was espoused to St. Joseph. Mary was not a single mother. That's heresy. All right, don't, don't listen to priests who say that. It says in the Greek and in the Latin that she was espoused already to St. Joseph. Okay, so she was not a single mom, pregnant single mom. This is, this is blasphemy. It's, it's wrong. What we see here is that Our Lady received a grace in the past that is perfect and continues into that present reality. So we say full of grace. Her grace is full. Remember, it's not because of anything she did to earn it. Look at what the Pope says. Pius IX said it was a singular privilege given to her. Elsewhere in the document, he talks about her being predestined by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ. She couldn't earn this magnificent grace in Immaculate Conception. She didn't even exist yet. This is why she is perfectly saved in the economy of God. So that's the first one. Okay, so what you do is you you take your friend who's either Catholic or Protestant or Eastern Orthodox, whatever, and you, they're not sure what's going on. A lot of people, when you think Immaculate Conception means the conception of Jesus, that's not, that's not it. Or they think virginal conception is Immaculate Conception. No. Immaculate Conception refers to the beginning of the Virgin Mary in the womb of St. Anne. That's what the Immaculate Conception is. So first off, you take them to Luke one twenty eight, and you you explain to them the Greek in Luke one twenty eight. The second one, you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall strike at his heel. heel. In the Vulgate, in the Dewey Rhymes, she shall crush your head. And you shall, I think it says lie wait at her heel. Let me look that up. Just read it the other night, doing Advent devotions. Yes, and thou shalt lie, lie in wait for her heel. My kids said, what does that mean? We had a great conversation about that. The key here is that God says, I will put enmities between you, Satan, and the woman. Her seed in your seed. Enmity is the division. It is the struggle. There, God is the one who places the enmities there between the woman and Satan. Here's the problem. If original sin touched the Virgin Mary, that means that Satan has dominion and power over her because of original sin. Also, if Mary were ever to commit a venial sin or a mortal sin in the future, after she was born, that means the devil would have power and dominion over the Virgin Mary. And yet, we read in Genesis, in the Proto-Gospel, the Proto-Evangelium, this is what people in the Old Testament had to believe. This is the creed that they had to believe in the Old Testament. God says, I will put enmities between Satan and the woman. There is then no intermingling between the life of the woman and the life of Satan. God placed the enmity. This means that the Virgin Mary was never touched by Satan, by sin, and by internal concupiscence or internal temptation. Number three. In the Old Testament, there was the Ark of the Covenant. It contained the Word of God in stone. It contained the Word of God, the Ten Commandments, engraved in stone tablets. In the New Covenant, there is a new Ark of the New Covenant, the Virgin Mary. 
The church fathers repeatedly call Mary the Ark of the Covenant. Now, is this just an analogy they made up on their own, or is this something they got from the Bible? It comes from the book of Revelation, from the Apocalypse. I'll, re I'll read it to you. It's Apocalypse chapter 11, the very last verse. Verse 19, moving into Apocalypse chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. By the way, you may not know this, Revelation is a term for the book of Revelation, but traditionally Catholics refer to the book of Revelation as the book of the Apocalypse. I see confusion sometimes because on Twitter or in videos, I'll talk about the book of the Apocalypse and people will say, what are you talking about? Book of the Apocalypse? That's not in the Bible. Yeah, it's in the Bible. It's the last book in the Bible. Look right here. Apocalypse. All right. Chapter 11, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hail. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried travailing in birth, and was in pain to be delivered. Here, St. John sees a vision of the Ark of the Testament, the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, and then in a moment that vision turns into a pregnant woman, a mother who gives birth to the Messiah. We see here that the Bible, the apocalypse, is associating the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testament, with the new Ark of the New Testament, and that is the Virgin Mary. Also, all the early Christians referred to Mary as the Ark of the Testament. It's widely attested. Widely, you can ask a Protestant historian of the Church Fathers, did the Church Fathers refer to the Blessed Virgin Mary's Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Testament? He will say yes. So if that's the case, and this woman contains the Son of God, she contains the Messiah, we know in the Old Testament that if you touch the Ark of the Covenant and you weren't a Levite, you didn't, that you, you died. Remember Uzzah in the Old Testament, the friend of David, the Ark of the Covenant, the, there was a stumbling and it was about to fall and he reached out and touched it. Boom, God killed him right then. Also, it was made out of special wood, which was incorruptible and it was layered. It was gilded with gold. And I can't remember which church father says it, but it says Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant, gilded not with gold, but gilded with the Holy Spirit. Mary is gilded with the Holy Spirit. So those are the three biblical uh, passages that you can go to to explain the Immaculate Conception. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Write this down. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis 3, 15. And then Revelation, Apocalypse, chapter 11, verse 19. Good. Now, to close up, I'm going to give the fourth and final uh, theological argument for Mary being conceived without original sin and living her whole life by a singular grace of God without sin and without internal concupiscence temptation. I actually went through this with my son. We were driving to Mass today uh, for the Mass, for the obligation of the Immaculate Conception. We were talking about this theological reality. One of the things we discussed is the second person of the Trinity had predestined that he would receive his human nature, not out of nothing, ex nihilo, but that he would receive human nature connected to all of us through Adam and Eve. That means he would receive his human nature from Mary's human nature. He would derive it from her. Since he is the Son of God, since he is perfect, he is the Logos, it is fitting that he would attain, he would acquire his human nature from a mother who was already pre perfectly in the past 
saved. So that she, being perfectly saved, in her person, in her flesh, in her body, in her humanity, that she would be a pure and clean vessel, for not only for the infant Christ, but that when she genetically gives human nature to the second person of the Trinity, she's giving something that's clean. Human nature undefiled. And this is why the church fathers always insisted that Mary was all holy, as they say in Greek, panagia, panagia, all holy, all sainted, all sanctified. Because in her womb, from her humanity, from her DNA, which has already been pre-purified, pre-sanctified, she gives the Son of God humanity, the human nature that we all share. One of the things my, my son said, it was, well, Dad, does that mean that, that Mary and Jesus weren't fully human then? And I said, well, were Adam and Eve fully human before they had original sin, before they fell? And he said, no. And he, he got the point. He said, yeah, good point. Good point. Because original sin, sinfulness, is not integral or essential to human nature. We, we almost think it is because it's so universal. But being a human originally with Adam and Eve did not include sin. And so for the new Adam, Christ, and the new Eve, Mary, they also begin their earthly existence without any sin. That's why we celebrate on December 8th the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Our Lady is Panagia. Our Lady is all holy. And I think this fourth and final argument is the most powerful. Is a Protestant really going, and by the way, Martin Luther believed in Immaculate Conception, but is an evangelical Protestant today going to say that the second person of the Trinity received his human nature from a corrupted, sinful, someone under the dominion of the devil, is he really going to say that the, the human nature was received by the second person of the Trinity in that context? It doesn't seem fitting. It doesn't seem right. Not right at all. And so Catholics in the Eastern Church as well have always maintained that Mary, her conception is unique and different than everyone else's conception. It's miraculous. It's supernatural. It's sanctified. And we honor that in our liturgical calendar every year in December. All right, well, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please click the like button, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate that. That tells YouTube it's a good video. And then please share this video. There's a little share button beneath the video. If you hit that button, it'll say, do you wanna share this to Facebook? Do you wanna share this to Parler? Do you wanna share this to Twitter? Do that, please do that. That's the most important thing that you can do for, for this podcast. And then if you're new, there's a little button in the corner. Uh, click on that and um, you can subscribe. And if you hit the bell, every time I uh, go live, you'll be notified, hey, Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast just went live. And uh, you can click the button and you can join us live. I also want to say something uh, before I go. While I was waiting to get the show going, there was a, a man in the live stream. Uh, if you're watching live on the right side of the screen, or if you're on a phone, it's below. Um, there was a bunch of comments. And I saw a comment from someone named Josh. I want to share this because I want you all to pray for him. Josh wrote, uh, Taylor Marshall, I'm be I'm getting baptized Sunday. Thank you for everything I've learned about the church. Praise God. Uh, will everyone, there's uh, over a thousand people, everyone today, please pray uh, an Our Father or Hail Mary for Josh. He's receiving the Holy Sacrament of Baptism on Sunday. And I think that's amazing. So, Josh, welcome home to the Catholic Church. What a time to be a Christian. What a time to be Christian. So, everyone in the comments, we all pray for Josh. I'd appreciate that. And um, also my, um, my new book, uh, Rosary in 50 Pages, has also just come out in time for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. So, you can get that over at Amazon.com. Appreciate everyone who's already got that. It's already a number one new release. And if you are a Patreon uh, supporter of mine at the student level or above, 
I'm going to send you a, a signed copy for Christmas to say thank you. And if you'd like to be a patron and um, take me up on that offer, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash uh, DR Taylor Marshall. Here's the button. There it is. Patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall student patrons and above. I'll send an autographed copy of the new book on the rosary. And as I say that, make sure you pray the rosary every single day. I met a, a young man after mass uh, recently, similar situation to Josh. And uh, he coming to the Latin mass, wearing a suit, just a fine young man. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of young people who are waking up and saying, I don't want this corrupt culture, this corrupt culture of free sex and junky TV shows and immorality and pornography and all that. I, I want to live for God and I want to be a Catholic. I want to start going to confession. I want to try, I want to try to be a saint like young men, like Josh, who's getting baptized this Sunday. So I know it's a hard time politically and in the church, but yet we also have to focus on the good and realize that as we read in John chapter three, the Holy spirit bloweth where he willeth. I like that in the Dewey Rhymes. He bloweth where he willeth. I think that's what it says, or breatheth where he willeth. Either way, it sounds cool. The Holy Ghost is still working in people's lives. And uh, we have to be hopeful and we have to praise God for that. So that being said, let's all keep praying the rosary every single day. Pray that rosary. If you don't pray the rosary every day, you're not on the team. You're not on the team. So pray the rosary daily. And um, what else? Well, let's pray. Let's do an Ave Maria. And uh, I'd like to, let's pray this Ave, Ave Maria for Josh and for all the people coming into the Catholic Church. Oremos. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in molieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et or mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Mighty God, we pray for all those who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ through your church. We ask that you would guide them, that you would protect them, that you would lead them to good and holy priests who will instruct them and teach them well, and also that they'll have good and holy friends. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Nomini Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, friends. Well, thanks again for watching. Again, if you like the video, please like it. And if you're new, please do take a moment and subscribe. And remember our Lord Jesus Christ said you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless. Godspeed. Ave Maria, Immaculate Conception. Pray for us.